share oh, their screen or we'll yeah. share our screen. If you can share your screen, wait. They should be able to like enable. Should we be seeing them now or seeing her again? Like yeah, you can a, just drag it. Oh, sure. Yeah. Oh, there you go. Hello. And then, oh, yeah. So then you can open PowerPoint here. You can see your notes, and it should be projecting the presentation yeah, yeah, yeah. without exactly. notes up here. Yeah. Yeah. So let's just try that. So there's GHCCs. There's with text. Oh, oh, David's there. Yay. Sorry, we're doing some tech stuff. So nobody sees that. If you wanted to meet, it's good. What's that? What's that? Okay, we got it. Oh, sweet. Perfect. What'd you do? But I just changed the input. But what? We want She's the. Well, this is going to be the. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oh yeah, get in Great. there. Thank you. <laughs> so well, I think we want them maybe to just share their screen. Why is the opening stuff? Right. Eventually, so after I I'm done introducing them, I guess. Or I should maybe I should I should share my PowerPoint through Zoom. Then we can see them and the opening slide. Does that make sense? Sure. Yeah. Can you guys hear us? We can't see you right now, but I see Angela. It seems like it is. I didn't yeah, do it. Yeah, I can hear you just fine. There's no video from your end. I can see David Mildrexler and myself. All right, let's see. I can see Angela. Yeah. And um, it says it says Rob Clavins for her name. And um, Rob Clavins, she, her. Oh. And, uh, <laughs> Jamie and Rob, you guys were a little gargled when I was listening to you. Oh. Okay. Well, it's, I'm just looking at myself there, but. Maybe uh, it's not too bad. Maybe you guys were talking at the same time. They were. Yeah, there's a lot of noise in the room right now. Okay. I think that sounds okay. Ready, Rob. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks for bearing with us, everyone. We're just getting some technical difficulties sorted, and we'll get started in like three minutes. Okie dokie. How's the how's the audience looking? Uh, it's great. Yeah, they can hear you and they're laughing at your your comment. We've got right. I don't know, 20 people. <laughs> I hope they're looking good. How is the sound? Hey, Paula, how is the sound back there? It's good for him. Okay. It's, yeah, very attractive people. Very attractive. <laughs> oh, wonderful. <laughs> Okay. This is funky. Oh, that's weird. Uh, you could also hear the control to close it. And there you go. Matthew's leaving us. We heard that. Uh, so if I want to share my screen. You all. Yeah, there's somebody with the open. And I gotta bring it over here. So if you put this mouse to the right, it goes up there. And if, if you go to the left, it comes back here. And it, it is a touch screen. So if you just want to like Oh, it, nice. It, 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 Cool. Covering nice. my logo, but <laughs> Angela and David, can you see my presentation? Yes. And I can nice. I, I also see four um I see the, the speaker gallery off to the right. So I, I see a couple things. I think you can drag drag the gallery to the other screen. That's a good idea. But we want people to see them, don't we? Yeah, but maybe when you're speaking. Okay, we'll just gotta just a little we'll figure it out one at a time and make sure everyone can see everyone and all that stuff. Oh, and I think they're looking at me here. Um, yeah, probably when we share our screen, it'd be nice to not see that much, at least uh, for the speaker to see that much of the speaker gallery. I think let's keep the speaker gallery here actually, because I think it's fine if they share the voices. Okay. I mean, that's why. Angela, cool. is that your press from based on your email too? Yes, that would okay. be fine. 
and cool. then maybe Q and A will put you guys up there. Nice. Okay. We should be able to be any questions. Yeah. Oh no. <laughs> it's not going to touch anything anymore. All right. Well, we're at three o'clock and we pretty much have a almost full house. Um, thank you all so much for joining us this afternoon. I know it's Saturday. It's the, almost the end of the conference. People are starting to drag a little bit. So we'll try and keep it high energy and exciting <laughs> to, to some extent. I can be the hype woman. Um, yeah, I'm Jamie. I'm the conservation director for Gator House Canyon Council. Um, I'll speak a little bit at the end. I'm also going to be moderating the Q&A. Um, I'm really excited to have you all join us for this panel on East Side Forests, Cut and Dry, catchy title <laughs> that our you know, Oregon Wilds Comms director came up with. Um, and we are joined by three of my favorite people, some of the most interesting and thoughtful people um, you'll get to hear from. Um, we'll first hear from Dr. David Mildrexler, who's a systems ecologist for Eastern Oregon Legacy Lands. Uh, then Dr. Angela Sandana, who is the Precious Lands Project leader for the Nez Perce tribe. Um, fellow advocate Rob Clavins, who's the Northeast Oregon Field Coordinator for Oregon Wild. Um, and then I'll bring us home. And uh, before we get going, um, just a little bit of context and grounding in place. How many of you are from the east side or have lived on the east side? One, two, three. We got three people in the audience. Central Oregon ish. Yeah, I'll count Central Oregon. Yeah, okay. We got like five ish and then all of the presenters. Oh, well, that's not great. Like Idaho or Utah. Well, that's not quite the Blue Mountains, but. um. Yeah, can you help me figure out why? I don't know, it's not, uh, I'm changing slides and it's not showing up here, sorry. sorry. Oh yeah, get in there. That's funny. It's not supposed to be in presentation mode. Um, yeah, it's not. Oh, oh no, it doesn't seem to be. Yeah, so maybe, it, I thought I hit from beginning. Resume slideshow? I wonder if you have a window where that's just stuck up. Yeah. Uh, which window are you showing? We have more. Thanks, oh, guys. Yeah. Is that are all these the same presentations? Uh, we could close everything and just reopen stuff. Focus too. on the presentation. Make sure you click focus on the presentation. Click focus. Where if do you, you drag the window off, you might have to focus on it. Then I won't be able to see it. You know, yeah, we can also just move it everything over there. That's right. easier. He's like, I don't know, man. You just figure it out. <laughs> How many millennials, Gen Z, and yeah, elder millennials <laughs> does it take to get a PowerPoint to work? I guess we're about to figure that out. We do have an IT professional here. Let's see, let's see. Well, I'll just try this. And we can't see. Hey, all right. All right. Well, now I can't see my notes, so I'm just winging it. So bear with me, because I'm three months into this job. So um, you can ask questions and correct me if I'm wrong. But yeah, just a little bit of context. Um, we're talking about the Blue Mountains ecoregion mostly, which is on the east side of Oregon. It's the biggest ecoregion in the state. Um, and it's got over 7 million acres of forest lands in it, even though most people don't think of it as a very forested landscape. Um, it's really important for that reason and many other reasons. Um, most people, when they think of East Side Forests, they think of like a place like the Ochoco National Forest, where I took this photo, like big, beautiful, open park-like Ponderosa stands. Um, but it, there's also a bunch of cool, juicy, dark, wet, dense, funky forests too. Um, and there's so much terrain there that you can have, you know, one forest that feels like a east side dry forest and then go over the ridge and you can feel like you're in a west side forest it's just so complicated over there um and yeah this really illustrates it kind of crosses the whole that whole kind of eastern half of the state connecting um the rocky mountain landscapes and the great basin the columbia plateau all the way over to the cascades so if you care about ecosystems on the west side of the cascades and you, you care about plants and animals being able to move back and forth um you should care about the blue mountains too because they're connecting all of the other ecosystems to each other. 
this place is really important for a number of reasons. We have almost a full assemblage of species that have been around since the last ice age, um, mostly missing grizzly bear, I think, which maybe we'll have back soon, or at least if you ask me, I think we should. Um, but yeah, place really cool wildlife, amazing big carnivores, really important fish and cute weird stuff like many different weasel species, which is my favorite uh, animal family. Um, and it's also an, a place with incredibly deep cultural history, which we'll get to hear a little bit more about today. Um, but it's something that's very present on the landscape. Tribes have been leading on conservation since time immemorial and are still very present in the landscape today in a way that's really cool, leading on fish restoration and a bunch of other things. And so with all of that in mind, I'm really excited to get us started today with our first panelist, uh, Dr. David Mildrexler. I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing my screen and hopefully you should be able to take over. David's always got a really serious face when he's getting his presentation. <laughs> okay. All this stuff is all in my way. Let me see if I can. All right, I always imagine that going way easier and smoother, but here we are. Uh, all right, thank you, Jamie. Um, thank you for those great points you made. Um, I'm really happy to be here alongside my colleagues to talk to you about Eastern Oregon's forest and particularly the Blue Mountains. Uh, thank, uh, thank you for the introduction, Jamie. I like to start with this beautiful picture of Joseph Canyon, which um, looks into the heart to the tributaries that reach up into the Wallawa Valley, into the Zumwalt Prairie, and on up to the snow-capped peaks of Oregon's largest wilderness area. Uh, this picture exemplifies many of the values of intact forest landscapes and the crucial habitats and connections that my colleagues are working to protect mm -hmm. here and across the Blue Mountains. And that's really what I'm here talking to you about today is why that work is so important in the Blue Mountains. I'd also like to start as, as uh, Jamie mentioned, just reflecting on uh, the moment of uh, this, this, taking a moment to reflect on the history of this landscape. And this map shows Nez Perce place name stretching all the way from the Pacific Ocean to the interior Rocky Mountains. And I, I, I like to just remember that you know, this landscape was once completely interconnected and, and people thought of it that way. There wasn't all of the jurisdictional boundaries and the cultural divides that we have today. Uh, right there in the middle in the red star is Joseph Canyon. So it sits right there in the heart of this uh, incredible interconnected landscape. And today we find ourselves in the midst of climate and biodiversity emergencies and pledges have been made by the world's governments to address both. The Pacific Northwest offers outstanding potential for natural climate solutions. And my partners and I are motivated by the knowledge that we live in a region that can make a significant contribution to solving some of humanity's most pressing problems if we make the right decisions. International, national and state targets have been established to protect 30% of land and waters by 2030 and 50% as intact natural ecosystems by 2050. Currently only 6.1% of forest land in the conterminous United States is protected at the highest level. And it's important to understand that the forest uh, itself is part of a large uh, natural climate solution. Uh, forests are crucial in mitigating climate change. They account for 92% of all terrestrial biomass globally and remove about 30% of our emissions annually from the atmosphere. Uh, forests provide critical habitats to more than half of all known plant and animal species on earth and approximately 75% of the world's accessible fresh water comes from forests. So these are essential for human well-being. But we've been hard on forests. We've, we've logged them for timber, we've cut them to make way for farms and cattle and cities and developments. And now climate change is stressing trees worldwide. But science has also shown that large intact areas that have not been substantially cleared or degraded by industrial land use continue to provide an incredible range of valuable ecosystem services, such as clean water, strongholds for biodiversity and old growth forests, regulating climate, and as a whole underpin key regional and planetary scale functions. 
And where we have protected forests, especially as part of a connected reserve system, we've seen that these values are fairly well preserved. And that's why forest protection is the key to achieving these global targets to protect 30 and 50% of the land and waters by 2030 and 2050 respectively. We need a systems approach to protect the functionality of the forest systems. Yet most of the world's forests are simply not managed for conservation of these values. My colleagues and I conducted a study to figure out where in the Western United States were the most high priority forests to protect for both carbon, biodiversity, and the benefits for drinking water. What we found was that we are able to achieve the 30 and 50% targets across all of the states in the Western United States, which was a, a really encouraging finding. And very interesting that Oregon has the largest forested area out of all 11 states, but the lowest proportion protected. Um, also, the Pacific Northwest has relatively low vulnerability to climatic stressors compared to the Southwest US. So there's a lot of opportunity in Oregon. In fact, there was so much opportunity that we thought it warranted a closer look. And so we conducted another study with 30 meter resolution data and looked at some of these same values specifically across Oregon. And one of the areas that emerged as crucial to achieving these conservation targets in our state is the Blue Mountains ecoregion. And both of these studies are uh, freely available online. Now, this was really great to see because we've been talking about the Blue Mountains and the values of it for many years. It's Oregon's largest ecoregion, um, and it also extends into Idaho and, and, um, and to southeast Washington and very intact areas of those states. As Jamie mentioned, it's a key connector between the Cascades and the Rockies, a single ecoregion linking these massive other mountain ranges. It's very important for addressing climate change, and also note that across the Pacific Northwest, the tribal cultures are crucial for working together to protect this landscape. And also, you know, what makes the Blue Mountains so unique is the diversity of forest types. And as you can see on the left, the forest type groups, each represented by a, a different color there, and then for all of the ecoregions shown in the different maps of Oregon and Washington, the, the forested ecoregions, you can see the Blue Mountains has a, a large diversity of different types of forest type groups. And there's also some notable gradients, like in the west of the Blue Mountains, you see more juniper and red and uh, ponderosa pine and orange. And as you go north, you see more dark green for the first spruce hemlock type and more light green Douglas fir. And on the right, you can see how these forest types really differ when you're in them. In these cool, wet, lush forest types, they're shaded, there's lichen hanging off the canopy, there's moss on the ground. And in the more open mixed conifer types shown down below, uh, more drier sites, a lot of sunlight penetrating through to the forest floor. So very different thermal dynamics in these types of forests. And that shows up in the biophysical data on the left where you can see land surface temperature and all of the national forests outlined in black. So while all forests cool the environment, the, the moist biophysical and cold biophysical environments cool it much, much more. And that's an important thing to know when we're thinking about climate change and increasing heat waves, that these forest types are actually buffering against climatic extremes in a much more strong way than the dry forest types. And these really unique patterns of the Blue Mountains are driven by just a, 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 its exceptionally unique physiography, the orientation of the Blue Mountains, and of course the Cascade Range that creates the large rain shadow effect that creates our deserts in Eastern Oregon, but also this really unique Columbia River Gorge. The Columbia River carves this very deep gorge through uh, the mountain range. We drive through it all the time and a lot of moisture, warm, moist air is funneled right through that system and heads straight to the Northern Blue Mountains, which you can see very clearly in the precipitation gradients across the Blue Mountains. Also, just to point out that the Blue Mountains are an incredible headwater system for Eastern Oregon. Look at the density of the stream network in the Blue Mountains. It's really the headwaters and feeds the adjacent much drier ecoregions. So we have a great diversity of old growth forests. On the left, you can see our spruce fir, fir types. These are some of my favorite uh, forest types in the entire Blue Mountains. I grew up on the west side, so I think they just 
remind me a lot of home. And they're, they're actually not a very even well studied forest type. They've kind of gone under the radar. And then we also have these dry forest types. And as Jamie mentioned, these systems can um, exist side by side, surprisingly close on the same landscape due to just aspect changes and also topography that has affected how soils are distributed across the landscape. And we wanted to know how much carbon were stored in these large trees because our large tree protection measure was being proposed to be weakened at the time. So we looked at this and we looked at a diversity of tree species again, because we knew that all of these species from moist to dry sites are very important. That's what makes the Blue Mountains so unique. Um, and we found for all of these species that they generally represent a very small proportion of the population. Just about 3% of the trees are over 21 inches, but they hold almost half the carbon. And as you can see with the dashed line, which represents the 21 inch limit, as they get bigger, those carbon stores just increase rapidly. So of course, if we wanna keep carbon out of the atmosphere, we need to keep these large trees in the forest growing. And then all of this complexity in the Blue Mountains is juxtaposed with the fact that it serves as this, as this massive wildlife corridor. On the left, you can see um, the whole Western United States and that most of the, the migration uh, corridors for mammals, birds, and amphibians are north to south. But the Blue Mountains introduces that east to west movement. On the right, you can see up closer the, the, the way that it interacts with the Cascades, the Great Basin, uh, the Columbia Plateau, and of course the Rocky Mountains. So a very unique uh, opportunity for species movements. And also think about plants being able to mix across this area as well. And yet we have this reserve system that is isolated and it's inequitably distributed. And um, when you just do this simple exercise of mapping out distances between them, you see, wow, we've got areas of 40 some miles uh, between reserves, lots of roads, um, between there's even private ground. So this system is simply inadequate to support the species habitat needs in the Blue Mountains. And with climate change, it's just nowhere near um, able to support the needs of this Blue Mountain region. And yet when you look up at that uh, corner where you see the 41.3 mile distance there between the Hell's Canyon and the Wanaha Tucannon wilderness, when you zoom in, on the left, it looks like this. In the red box, you can see that there are roadless areas and those roadless areas correspond with areas of very high landscape resilience. And we see that across the whole Blue Mountains that our roadless areas together with our, our wilderness areas are the connective tissue they are linking the system together. On the right, you can see Joseph Canyon and Wild Horse that we showed, I showed you a picture of earlier and notice its proximity right next to the tribal land that Angela will talk to you about in just a minute here. And so when we look at the whole Blue Mountains, all of these roadless areas mapped in green, they actually double the area of the existing wilderness areas mapped in light green. They make the system more whole. They provide the connective tissue that allows species to move across this landscape in a much more inhibited a fashion than the rest of the landscape does. So if we are serious about protecting connectivity across this landscape, which we are, we need to protect these roadless areas. And these are areas like the Wallawa Mountains and Elkhorn Mountains are mountain watersheds. And at the low elevations in the Wallawa Mountains, places like the Huckleberry Mountain roadless area, and our major river corridors, places like the Grand Ronde River, which are uh, essential to, the, to the, the culture and the identity of Eastern Oregon, major river systems where we could still protect roadless areas along their main stems. And the old growth forest that Jamie mentioned, the, the Lookout Mountain, Ponderosa Pines, and on the other side of the Blue Mountains, the Ignaha River Corridor, ancient Ponderosa Pines. And then of course, the great, just awe-inspiring wildlands of the Hell's Canyon country. These are all the different roadless areas that to together compose the web of habitats that really make the Blue Mountains what it is. And then of course, Joseph Canyon and Precious Lands, these important cultural landscapes, the birthplace of Chief Joseph. And with that, I'll hand it off to my colleague, Angela Sandana. Thank you.
Nice job, David. Thank you. All right, we see your PowerPoint coming up here. Nice, looks good. But you're muted. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Perfect. Well, thank you, David, for that wonderful overview. And now I would like to spoke, focus much more narrowly on a particular watershed in the Blue Mountains, which is a high priority for the tribe and our partners for fish recovery and conservation of wild landscapes. And that's Joseph Canyon. And I'll start with the Precious Lands Project. And the Precious Lands Project is a wildlife management area that is cooperatively managed between the Nez Perce Tribe and the Bonneville Power Administration. Are my slides advancing? Oh, there we go. Okay, so a cooperative project. This project is mitigation for the federal hydro system. And this image here shows the Columbia River system, which is absolutely massive. It includes basically all of Idaho, a majority of Oregon and Washington, as well as a big chunk of Western Montana. And these river systems connect us ecologically, culturally, and, and significantly for all of our wildlife species. And it provides the ecological context for all of our work. And the Precious Lands Project is specifically mitigation for the system of four lower Snake River dams here in eastern Washington. These are the dams, these are the fish killing dams that the tribe has worked hard to uh, get removed. And as part of their construction, Bonneville Power was forced to do mitigation for the losses to wildlife habitat. And that's how the Precious Lands came about. So project goals for this particular project, this is to solely benefit wildlife and their habitats. Specifically, this project aims to protect native plant communities so that they can support increasing populations of desirable wildlife, including black bear, elk, deer, bighorn, sheep, Rocky Mountain wolf, and other species of importance to the Nez Perce tribe. And to promote ecological functions and provide for reasonable public access. So this area has a variety of cover types and includes 16 miles of perennial stream. So you think of these canyon lands as being really dry and, and sort of desolate, but they're, they are connected by these amazing streams. And you can see Joseph, Joseph Creek right here in the upper right corner. So we have over 16 miles of perennial stream, 11 miles of intermittent streams, two federally listed species, steelhead and Spalding's catchfly, and a wide variety of species of conservation concern. And although this project is fairly small, it's only 17,466 acres, it is strategically located to provide important winter range and connectivity between other managed landscapes. So the precious lands are seen here in the middle of the screen in pink, and they are immediately adjacent to the Wallow Whitman National Forest in the south, and they are near the Umatilla National Forest over here in the northwest, and it connects over to the Craig Mountain Wildlife Area here in Idaho. And if we go even closer, we can see that the entire southern border of the Precious Lands Wildlife Area bounds on the Wallowa Whitman National Forest and the Hell's Canyon National Recreation Area. So the Wallowa Whitman National Forest actually manages and controls the headwaters of Joseph Creek. Our project is in the lower end of the watershed, but the National Forest can control the entire watershed, upper watershed of this area. So whatever they do on that landscape, whatever management they impose, has a significant impact to the quality and quantity of, of wildlife and wildlife habitat on our wildlife area. And again, water is key. Here you can see the Grand Ronde River on that top part of the screen flowing to the east and into the Snake River. And then Joseph Canyon flows along this way in a diagonal direction flowing into the lower Grand Ronde. And we have approximately 10 miles of Joseph Creek proper that runs through the Precious Lands area. 
And it's because of this rich water resource and how important it is that the Nez Perce tribe nominated over 120 miles of stream for consideration under the River Democracy Act. And the River Democracy Act is uh, sponsored by Senators Wyden and Merkley in Oregon, and it would establish wild and scenic river designations for streams throughout the state of Oregon. And the tribe nominated over 120 miles within the Joseph Creek watershed, and specifically about 17 miles of streams that are associated with the precious lands wildlife area that the tribe actually owns. And we've been questioned why the tribe would willingly accept additional federal overlays on land that they own. And the simple answer is it's the right thing to do to mitigate climate, to protect the fishery resource, the wildlife resource, and the corridors that those streams uh, provide. It's the right thing to do. But more importantly, everything we do is filtered through and informed by the Nimipu culture. And the Nimipu, like all indigenous cultures, is a culture of place, evolving over millennia uh, by the landscapes, the resources, the climate of where they lived and, and raised their children. And it is this culture of respect, reciprocity, renewal, resiliency and relationship that we want to promote as a solution to the current climate crisis. It is this worldview that we want to highlight as a solution to our modern day climate crisis. And as a sovereign government, the Nez Perce tribe has significant treaty rights and is uniquely positioned to provide leadership in solving this climate crisis. Federal agencies have a trust responsibility to consider tribal interests and viewpoints when formulating new policies or proposing projects. They must consult with the tribes uh, during their decision making so tribal leaders can have can interject their values and their their conservation values onto those decisions with their federal partners. The Nez Perce tribe also has incredible agency as an independent nation. They are currently the only tribe in the nation to have a climate and energy subcommittee as part of their elected leadership. And that committee and their partners are actively engaged in developing regional solar power and other climate smart projects. One of those projects is the Camas to Condors Climate Initiative. This is a project that is a collaboration between the tribe, Greater Hells Canyon Council, Yellowstone to Yukon, the Wallawa Homeland Project, Eastern Oregon Legacy Lands, and other partners. So why camas and condors? Because both are focal species that honor tribal lifeways. Camas is a primary producer associated with wetlands, while condor is at the other end of the spectrum as an apex scavenger. And we also need to honor the coho as representing our aquatic relatives that tie us all together. These species are also significantly impacted by climate change. The tribe recently completed a vulnerability assessment and learned that the climate is, impact, is impacting a full suite of treaty reserved resources, impacts to the timing of emergence of root foods, hunting impacts through emergence of disease, and other changes that the community is very concerned about. So to combat these negative impacts, we want to highlight the ecological potential of the Blue Mountain ecosystem to perpetuate biodiversity, promote connectivity, build resiliency in our communities, connect people and cultures, and restore lost species, such as California condor, grizzly bear, and coho. The coho have actually begun to return thanks to the efforts of the tribe, but much work remains to restore condors and grizzlies, but we are working on it. 
Specifically, the tribe uh, has initiated an, a multi-year effort to restore condors to Hell's Canyon. This image shows what we hope to see in 10 or 20 years, condors back on the landscape. We've completed the feasibility study and found that it provides incredible habitat conditions for condors. There's abundant nesting, roosting, and foraging areas. The area has few people or large human population centers, which is amazing for a wide ranging species like the condor. There are threats, however, uh, primarily wind energy development, as well as ongoing use of lead for hunting. And this ongoing impact of spent lead on the landscape highlights the disconnect between modern humans and our environment. We need to more fully realize that what we do to the land, we do to ourselves. More importantly, we do those things to our children and to their children. We need a complete paradigm shift to recognize that we are dependent on the same ecological systems as wildlife, and we need to do a better job protecting those ecosystems. Our very survival depends on it. Which is what the Camas to Condors Partnership aims to do. One of our vision statements states that we strive to have a region where stewardship priorities powerfully shape land management that is responsive, holistic, and just. So think about that for a minute. Stewardship priorities shape our land management in a responsive, holistic, and just manner. That would be a significant shift away from the cash-driven, extractive worldview that currently drives much of our land management decisions, including decisions on national forest system lands. That's why we see these highly fragmented landscapes with not a lot of motivation or current uh, efforts to connect those landscapes to provide for all of the species that occur here. But we can achieve this, but it has to be achieved through inclusive partnerships and collaboration. Positive change must be based on a shared conservation values and goals. But it will take all of us to take ownership of this landscape. We need to get connected and to get involved. And our next two speakers will highlight ways that you can do that because it's gonna take all of us to build this resilient, vibrant, connected landscape that we need to move into the next century. Thank you. All right, give me see how I do with the technology here. Uh, not so well. You can give my presentation. <laughs> Let me get mine going here. Uh, no. Okay. Something's happening. Go oh boy. I'm gonna let you yeah. can you do that? Do you know what's happening? <laughs> I don't know. Can I? We're about to find out. Uh, 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 no. Sorry. We have a uh, at tech help. Let me let them do it. Oh, oh, oh no. Good. One moment. Here you go. I'm gonna let you do that. <laughs> oh. You don't want to leave the left. That's the only thing I contribute to that. Are you guys still there? <laughs> yeah, they're there. Okay. I see someone moving. Wait, so where's the presentation? Uh it's it's not open yet. Oh well it is. Let's see. Is it, it's not not one of these no weird. okay let's is it saved in here uh it's right it's uh this one right here uh no text yeah so angela so you, you yeah this, here uh, right up there? there yeah and angela and david can you still hear us we can hear you yep okay can you see the presentation I can't. I'm seeing like the gallery view right now. Yeah. Thanks for your patience. Yes. 
I think we would have figured out Zoom by whatever year it is. Oh, this one right here. Hey. We're doing it. We're doing it. That's not it. Oh, that's not it? Nope. It's this oh. one. <laughs> uh, maybe just start the slideshow. Nope. Nope. Give it a hers. I can see the Ruby Peak picture now. Oh, that makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> How is this possible? I think we have this computer connected to like two other places. Yeah, that it's on track. Track. It's uh, it's, oh, geez. Yeah. But, yeah, I'm going to stop here. Brilliant. Yeah, I, I see what you're doing there now. Hey. hey. When they don't even see my face. Um, yeah, yeah. Oh, it all has to be over here. Yeah. All right. Maybe. Yeah. Uh, I'm not make this. Yeah, it's happening. Well, that's not it. of uh, it's underneath the. Yeah. <laughs> you can go to the bottom. Nice slideshow. Oh, man. Singing the hurt lock. From the beginning. Yeah, perfect. All right. Awesome. Wow. Yeah. Well. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, oh, that's cool. I can see it over there too. Um, yeah, well, thank you, um, everybody for your patience. Thank you, Will. Um, <laughs> and thanks, Angela and David for making such a strong case uh, why this landscape is so important and uh, sharing your encouraging efforts. Um, Eastern Oregon is really an incredibly place. Uh, it's special in ways that I think are tangible and harder to describe or quantify, but that I don't think are, are any less important. Uh, this is a photo of our farm with the protected Eagle Cap Wilderness in the background. Um, I'm really thankful to be able to call this place home and understand why the Nimipu who have lived here since time immemorial never gave it up. Uh, it's important, I think, to remember we all live on stolen lands, or most of us anyway. Um, well, some values may be intangible. Sadly, the crises that we face with climate, biodiversity, water, uh, justice, and basic civility are all very real. And I think these landscapes have a part to play in all of that, and I believe that they're, they're big enough to matter. Unfortunately, my role here is to be the downer and show you that the threats are also very real. Um, because these places are remote, um, they're hard to get to, there aren't a lot of outspoken conservation advocates or resources in Northeastern Oregon. Uh, because of the weaponization of the rural urban divide uh, and the myths, the mythologies, the misunderstandings um, about our part of the world, a lot of it flies under the radar. And further, there are ongoing efforts to marginalize conservation voices in Eastern Oregon, even by people who claim the mantle of conservation and stewardship. Um, and part of why we're here today um, is to make sure that we're the ones that are telling our own stories. Um, since we're so told that the so-called timber wars are over, uh, most folks seem to think that the bad old days of industrial logging and, uh, and old growth logging are over. Um, I'm sorry to say that large scale industrial logging is back in a big way in Eastern Oregon. The difference is that now it's framed with nice language like collaborative or restoration or forest health. And those nice terms can be genuine, but just as often, if not more likely, um, they are to obfuscate what's really going on. Um, I've been working on timber sales for well over a decade, which is nothing compared to some of you in this room, um, but I've not seen a single one that was called the logging project in its title. Um, some of the collaboratives like the Northern Blues Forest Collaborative actively marginalize uh, mainstream science and conservation voices to rubber stamp and greenwash uh, these projects. And frustratingly, uh, these groups tend to tell the Forest Service what they wanna hear. Um, and they give politicians the ability to avoid engaging in thorny issues. Um, and when you couple that with the decline of the court's willingness to enforce environmental laws, there's a decreasing degree of transparency and especially accountability. Um, it's a dynamic that we've covered in previous presentations at PILC, and I've got a couple of the, uh, the URLs down there that I encourage you to watch if that's something you're, you're interested in. Um, I'm told that a picture is worth a thousand words, so I'm going to let photos do most of my talking. Um, we've done more in-depth presentations on some of these projects as well, so please reach out if you're interested in learning more. Um, I'm going to focus mainly on um, Forest Service lands, um, but the things like this are happening um, on private lands on a massive scale. Uh, this photo is taken on Swamp Creek, uh, just upstream from its confluence with, uh, with Joseph Creek. Um, and these are the practices that are making our public lands all the more important uh, as refugia, but at the same time as industry is liquidating their own forests, um, they claim that they're running low of, of supply and uh, in Eastern Oregon and to offset that, they're increasingly turning towards public lands to keep the profits flowing to places like Boise and Lake Oswego and, and Ontario. 
And of course, it's not the most um, naturally productive. Uh, it is the most naturally productive forests that, that are being targeted. Um, I'm going to focus primarily on controversial, uh, the controversial Lower Joseph um, restoration project as the primary example of what we see happening in the diverse forests of Eastern Oregon. Um, the project has been touted as a success by the agency and folks who make as much as six figure salaries from their role in what I like to call the collaborative industrial complex. Um, this was the first project in what uh, is called the East Side Strategy. Um, it's the scheme um, from the Forest Service that was billed as the idea to use collaboratives to propose landscape scale uh, logging projects that increase the pace and scale of what they call restoration. And exactly. <laughs> and uh, I, I bet when most of you think about restoration, you're not thinking chainsaws, bulldozers, uh, road building and clear cuts. Um, but what the agencies and logging collaboratives really mean by increasing the pace and scale of restoration is doing more logging and doing more logging faster. And in my experience, doing bigger, more controversial things faster is generally not a good recipe for success. Um, this is a screenshot. Um, well, the photo on the right is my personal flourish. Um, the rest is an otherwise unadulterated uh, screenshot from the Forest Service's description of this project. Um, I included it here because I think it's important to see how the agency and their collaborators talk about these things. I mean, who could oppose uh, a project, a restoration project with such nice language? Uh, the Lower Joseph Project area is nearly 100,000 acres and gets its name from Joseph Canyon, which you've already heard a little bit about. Uh, the project area overlaps with Joseph Canyon and the Nez Perce Precious Lands. Uh, and again, while the landscape includes grasslands and dry pine forests, it also includes diverse forests and even stands of Pacific U. Uh, which is indicative of some of the, the wettest and most naturally productive forests um, that you can imagine. Uh, initial proposals on the project included logging over, I think, 10,000 acres of inventoried roadless areas. Uh, and the final proposal was almost entirely about logging in some of Oregon's wildest landscapes. Um, to offset that, nearly every promotional piece about, this, uh, about the project talks about two culvert replacements. Um, and not only is that a teeny part of a 100,000 acre project, um, but it hasn't happened and we're told it probably never will. Um, and uh, it, it also didn't address any number of other legitimate restoration needs, be it grazing reform, carbon sequestration, public lands protection, off-road vehicles, the list goes on. It's nearly all about logging. And despite being called a collaborative project, uh, it was developed by the Forest Service and collaborative. There you go. I think you got it. And then if you just uh, minimize, perfect. Um, and then, you know, so yeah, let's see, what are we on now? Um, yeah, and as with nearly, you know, all logging projects, we are seeing compacted soils, expect a massive increase in invasive plants. Um, skipping, yeah. Um, we also saw trees that were meant to be saved. Um, uh, oh, instead damaged just on a massive scale. At best, it's sloppy. Um, at worst, and seemingly based on how it happened nearly everywhere, it seems like it was 
was on purpose. You can't click that. We're not recording your presentation. Okay. Do you want to stop? I think we got to share the screen. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> I think that yeah, now the Zoom recording is uh, just looking at everyone's faces. Yeah, yeah. Oh. Sorry, you guys are stuck in the bummer part. At least this is the. All right. I think the first one. There you go. Perfect. Okay. Great. Yep. Yeah. Slide them over to the screen. There you go. Yeah. Perfect. Ish. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, and then this is actually, I think, the most some of the most heartbreaking stuff. Um, even the ancient trees that were meant to be saved by the project, trees that had lived for centuries, uh, protected by the forests of which they were a part, uh, they blew over in the first windstorm after the Forest Service and Collaborative restored them, um, the forest to protect them. And it's not over. Uh, only a small portion of the landscape has been logged. I think we have another 15,000 acres to go. Mm -hmm. Um, meanwhile, industry is complaining that they're not making enough profit. So among other things, for future sales, uh, the agency is talking about reanalyzing the project to allow an experimental form of steep slopes logging. Um, they're also talking about reopening this road, um, the Cold Springs Road, and turning it into a log haul route that is a more direct path to the mill in Idaho. Uh, the road is basically impassable now, which is a good thing. Uh, if you overlaid it with David's maps, you would see that it is the only development separating two of Oregon's largest roadless areas. And were it reopened, the immense cultural and ecological damage would go far beyond the footprint of the road. And Lower Joseph is not an anomaly. This is the Pewterbaugh project in uh, just to the south, uh, where they logged centuries old ponderosa pine along the Amnaha Wild and Scenic River to uh, save the forest from insects. Uh, this is the Lostine Safety Project, where they logged some of the biggest, oldest, and most fire resistant trees in a wild and scenic river corridor to protect a subdivision that is miles away, uh, but in the process likely made it even more vulnerable. Um, even at the height of a hot, dry summer during a historic drought, when these photos were taken, um, these forests were cool, they were wet, they were full of life. And again, just to reiterate, Eastern Oregon forests are not all sage, juniper, and pine. Uh, these photos taken in the same stands as the previous slides after the logging, um, the, forest service, the forest was exposed to more wind and sun. And as a result, rather than reducing the fire risk, the forest floor was hot and crunchy and brown and dry. Um, and it's telling that when we visited the project this winter, um, the folks who designed the project, they've moved on. Um, but the ones implementing it, they never talk about it being a, a safety project anymore. Uh, leaving the Wulao Whitman, this is the Big Mosquito Project in the Malheur National Forest. Uh, this is another collaborative special where the Blue Mountain Forest Partners uh, logging collaborative celebrated a project meant to protect and enhance old growth. Um, it took Blue Mountain Biodiversity Project to document what, what was really happening. Uh, and when the collaborative was told what the agency was actually logging old growth, um, rather than looking uh, or asking questions or raising concerns, uh, we learned in a FOIA that they told the Forest Service, quote, we trust you implicitly. Uh, and despite spending millions of dollars to these collaboratives, decision makers like Senator Merkley say they don't want to get involved with the project scale um, and are not holding anyone accountable. Instead, they're sending millions more and telling um, forest and wildlife advocates to raise their concerns at the collaboratives uh, that are getting ever more secretive and exclusive and whose leadership is actively marginalizing any dissenting voices. Uh, they're nowhere near done. Uh, this is the Morgan Nesbitt project. Uh, it, the scoping notice just came out. Uh, it's in one of the areas that David highlighted as being one of the most important and irreplaceable uh, forested connectivity corridors on the continent. Uh, miles from the nearest paved road, the Forest Service is proposing aggressive logging like you've seen in these other pictures in 87,000 acres extending from the edge of the Eagle Cap Wilderness down into the Hell's Canyon National Recreation Area. And uh, using discretion given to them by the Trump administration, the project proposal also includes logging the largest trees um, on the landscape and near clear cuts in forests that have till now managed to uh, escape chainsaws for their entire existence. Uh, this is one of the wildest landscapes in the lower 48. It is home to endangered fish and plants uh, and wildlife, including Oregon's only known wolverine, as well as likely lynx. Um, it's absolutely full of uh, cultural sites that date back thousands of years. And personally, it's a place I've gotten to know really well because it's the place where wolves first came back to Oregon. And if we give them a chance, it's also the place where grizzly bears are going to come back. And of course, it's all in the name of restoration and forest health. And, and don't get me wrong, there are parts of this landscape that uh, are suffering from decades of overgrazing, fire suppression, unmanaged off-roading, past logging, and other mismanagement. But rather than address any of those issues, the agency plans to restore the area with chainsaws, bulldozers, industrial logging, and road building. 
And at the risk of belaboring the point, it's a project being adopted by another collaborative effort that's been the recipient of millions of taxpayer dollars um, that are cert almost certainly going to rubber stamp and greenwash the proposal and, uh, based on the past history, celebrate success no matter how good or bad it is. And sadly, um, you know, what I'm sharing is the rule, not the exception. Um, the Ellis Project in the Umatilla includes proposals for logging the largest 3% of trees on the landscape, as much as 27,000 acres of pristine forest. Uh, immediately next door, uh, um, they recently proposed a massive roadless logging project uh, on Texas Butte. The South Warner Project in the Fremont Wainema is thousands of acres that's, uh, and they're skipping standard scientific analysis and public process using a categorical exclusion. Um, these are the projects that are on this map are all uh, marked in red stars and the inset jo shows just how much more there is in a single national forest within that landscape. So we're just talking about the very tip of the iceberg. So remember that when you hear about a collaborative restoration or forest health project, uh, it could be good. Uh, but these are also real world examples. And in my experience, they're far more uh, closer to the rule than the exception. Um, our corner of the world is relatively remote and unpopulated. So these things happen without getting a lot of attention. But again, I think our landscape is big enough to matter. Uh, it matters locally for its own values um, to local indigenous communities, but it also matters um, at the regional and global scale. And I think it's important to always remember, especially when we're talking about national forests, uh, we're talking about your land. To the extent this belongs to anybody, it belongs to all of us equally, um, whether we're lucky enough to live here um, or whether we're one of those people who profit economically from, from these forests. And before I hand it off to, to Jamie, I just wanna note that it isn't all doom and gloom. Um, we have a really wonderful coalition of conservationists working in Eastern Oregon with really a, a renewed um, uh, energy to counter some of the greenwashing that we've seen from the collaborative industrial complex and, and put forward a positive vision. Um, after decades of, of being bullied, uh, we're also increasingly working with the, the many rural communities uh, and citizens who share our values and have been encouraging them to, to raise their voices. And I want to close by saying that, you know, I'm never going to be able to do justice to how special these places are and how important they are for both tangible and intrinsic uh, uh, values alike. The threat to them is real and it's increasing, um, but so is their value. And again, I think they can play a role in addressing the climate, biodiversity, and, and cultural crises we face. Um, so to do that, I think we can focus on real restoration uh, that pays living wages. Uh, we can focus on just transitions to rural economies that aren't based on what we can take as natural resources, but rather recalibrate our relationships to these places and values. Uh, we can work with tribes and other entities to ensure environmental justice. Uh, we can protect public lands with new and existing designations um, that protect our ways of life, environment, and economies. Um, and we're working on that. And I'd be remiss not to point to Senator Wyden's River Democracy Act, which Angela also talked about as a great first step that would help by designating wild and scenic rivers in uh, Northeast Oregon and across the state that are sort of the cores and the lifeblood of these important landscapes. Uh, we have President Biden's executive order that uh, promises future protections for old growth and mature forests and trees. And then again, of course, we have the important research um, uh, from independent science
well, you're going to get a lot of screen time in the YouTube video. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's the first bar one, THC. Right yep. Like and subscribe. Thank you. Okay. Okay. I think I'm talking. Yep. David and Angela, can you hear us over here? Yes. And yes. we can see the East Side Forest cut and dry screen again. We're back. Thank you, Will. The hardest working tech person for the whole the whole dang weekend. Um, okay. Well, I'm going to try and bring us home on this with uh, a couple of remarks, and then we'll move into uh, into Q and A. So I am representing Greater Hill. You can see right there. Uh, Greater Hills Canyon Council is the name of the organization that I work for. I'm only three months in, so you're going to have to give me a little grace here. Um, our executive director was supposed to be here presenting, and she couldn't make it, so I am pinch hitting for us. Um, and yeah, so this is a little example of what part of our mission area looks like. Um, we, the kind of the three main words I think that are the themes of our work at Greater Health Canyon Council is connect, protect, and restore. Um, and we're doing it for all, you know, human and non human life that's in the Greater Health Canyon region, which includes um, the, the Greater Blue Mountain ecosystem. Um, if you have ever heard of us, which I recognize you may not have, yeah, some of you have, awesome. Um, we used to go by Hell's Canyon Preservation Council when we got our start as a grassroots grassroots group in the 60s, uh, working to stop the damming of Hell's Canyon. Um, and after we were successful in that, with uh, alongside many other people who we were working in coalition with, um, we kind of took a step back and realized there's a lot of other stuff going on in this area, as Rob pointed out. Um, and so here are a few of the things that you uh, might see us doing now. Um, we get out in the field with people for fun and for more serious kind of ground truthing efforts, trying to keep an eye on uh, what the Forest Service is getting up to in our area. Um, and we're also trying to connect with the broader recreation community in Oregon by introducing the Blue Mountains Trail, which I'll talk a little bit more about later. And we kind of approach this work in three ways, which you can't really see. I might jinx it by moving this. I think it's going to be okay. Um, we try to do this work by connecting place to place, people to place, and people to people. And as Rob kind of pointed out, and as I'm sure you know, if you live in Northwest or you live in Oregon, we're kind of up against a lot in this part of the state. Um, but we believe so intensely that this place is so special and it deserves protection. It deserves effort. Um, that we refuse to give up. And so we're coming at it from every angle, creative ways, weird ways, fun ways, hard ways, just trying to figure out how to get things done. So approaching it from these three ways. Um, and now the slide is not moving. Nope. Oh, well, no, this is the only one. We, hey, there we go. Um, wow, we got an orphan letter. This is fun. You're going to notice that I, I stole several slides from people who have already presented today, so I apologize for that, but um, connecting place to place is really important to our work. Um, and as as David presented, um, we have some amazing high quality lands in in the Blue Mountains, uh, but they're pretty far from each other and uh, they need to be a little closer together. And one of the reasons that they need to be closer together is because this area is truly like a super highway for migration and biodiversity. I told Rob, I spent, I think, two hours looking at different maps to try and pick one to put in this presentation to explain how important the Blue Mountains are. And I ended up just using the same slide that I started with because it's, it's, this is like a whole PhD program. It could be five PhD programs just trying to quantify the ecological significance of the Blue Mountains. And if you look at this place on a map for carbon storage, biodiversity, you know, potential for movement, terrestrial resilience, like the Blue Mountains light up like a Christmas tree. It's just, uh, it's, it's really impressive to show how valuable this place is. Um, the next way that we're trying to uh, do this work is connecting people to place, which if you're here in person, you can't see that text, uh, but I'm not going to touch the Zoom again. Um, people to place. You know, the old adage, like people protect what they love and they can't love something if they've never been there. And most people have never been here. So we're trying to help connect folks to this region um, by the creation of the Blue Mountains Trail, which, you know, I can't take any credit for. This is a multi-decade project that just came to fruition publicly in 2021. It's a 530 
mile trail that connects Joseph to John Day um, oh. through the seven wilderness areas um, in e Eastern Oregon. And uh, it's a pretty special thing. Only a few people have hiked it all the way through. And if you're interested, you should take a look on our website um, to find more information about it. And we have a couple reasons that you also can't read uh, about why we're why we worked on this project. Um, one is trying to spread the wealth of the recreation economy in Oregon. It's a pretty it's a pretty big amount of money that Oregon's bringing in um, from people who are coming to hunt, fish, hike, and a bunch of other things. A lot of that's going to Joseph. A lot of that's going to Bend. A lot of that's not going to like Tollgate and Sumter if you've ever been to those places. Um, but we want people to go there and the people who own businesses there, they would like people to come visit. And so in addition to routing the Blue Mountains Trail through those wilderness areas, we also routed it through these small towns so people can stop, buy their bag of Cheetos, get their mail, whatever it is you do when you're on a long trail. I haven't done that yet, but I'd like to. Um, the second thing is we're trying to contribute to the kind of backlog of trail maintenance that's in some of these uh, you know, public lands and uh, wilderness areas. The Forest Service is wildly understaffed in their recreation department, as in many other departments. Um, and so we were fortunate to actually hire a Blue Mountains Trail coordinator on our staff um, to almost full time this year. And he's working on getting cooperative agreements with the Forest Service, organizing trail parties, and partnering with other local organizations like the Wallow Mountains Hells Canyon Trails Association um, that already has a really strong presence doing trail maintenance on forests um, to help make sure that the Blue Mountains Trail stays open. Um, and then third and finally, we created this because we just want to invite people like you to come and fall in love with this landscape. Um, there is a long history, and this is a surprise to nobody, of, um, you know, timber interests and cattle interests being the dominant voice in the Blue Mountains. Um, and while those are valid uses of lands, they're not the only uses of lands. And people who live anywhere should have a say in how they're protected. And we're looking down looking down the barrel at some really big projects that could affect the whole future of the Blue Mountains um, pretty soon. So we'd like you to come out and learn about it and see why it's so awesome and join some of our groups to help us uh, make some good decisions about the future of it. This is just a couple slides to give you an idea of where the Blue Mountains Trail goes. Superimposed over David's map, um, it connects the seven wilderness areas in Eastern Oregon. You get to go through the Wallawas Eagle Cap Wilderness. This is in the Amnaha country. The eagle, um, not the eagle cap, the Elkhorn Crest, uh, right outside of Baker City in Sumter. This is the North Fork John Day Wilderness, and you can see how cool and uh, different these forests are compared to some other forests that you might expect. And then uh, you also get to go through some areas near Sumter, all the way down to the Strawberry Mountains. Um, yeah, right outside of John Day and Prairie City. Very cool. Another way we're working to connect people to place is by doing some citizen science work. So we're working with a number of local partners to, to do a Northeast Oregon beaver survey on the iNaturalist app, which anyone who has a smartphone can be a part of this effort. Um, I think that part, you know, part of having healthy Eastside forests is also having healthy watersheds and getting beavers back on the landscape is something that GHCC is really committed to. Part of that effort is just figuring out where they are. It seems like we don't have a very good idea in Oregon generally of where beavers are. And so we're asking people like you, if you're out hiking and kayaking um, to help us figure that out. And that information is also, be, is also being used by ODFW, the Forest Service, the Grand Braun Model Watershed um, and others. And finally, connecting people to people. Um, this means a lot of things. I think traditionally when you're thinking about a conservation organization, you might imagine like, oh, I'm out, I'm out and about in the public. I'm meeting people, you know, I, maybe I'm at a festival or I'm talking to someone at a, um, you know, a technical event. Um, but it also means, you know, who are we, you know, people who work for a white led conservation organization, who are we connected to and who are we listening to as we're advocating for changes on a huge swath of what I think is maybe one of the most important ecosystems in Oregon. Um, and part of that means that we need to be connecting and listening to the original inhabitants of this place. You know, the place that I'm working in is the homelands of the Wallawa Bend Nez Perce, the Cayuse, the Umatilla, the Walla Walla, and farther, uh, the farther you go down in the blues, also the folks who belong to the Confederate tribes of the Warm Springs and also the Burns Paiute tribe. Um, you know, we're really trying to think about how the blues can be in excellent condition long term. How can this habitat be the most connected? How can these forests be healthy? And 
um, how can we have a resilient ecosystem moving into the future and who better to like follow in the footsteps of and talk and listen to than the people who have literally been living here for at least, I don't know, 17,000 years. Um, they kind of know what's up. So we're really trying to uh, make sure that we're in partnership with these folks and actually deeply listening to them, taking their feedback and incorporating that into the work that we're doing. So in conclusion, um, we are in a really unique situation. This place is super important, but it also has some really big challenges. But if the people that you've heard you know, uh, present today and some of the other people who are in the room who are doing really important work, if this is any indication of the strength of the coalition of people who really care about this landscape, if, if this is what we're getting into, I think that we are on the right track. Um, but we do need help from all of you to make that happen as we move through time and we start to come up against some of these big projects that are getting ready to start here in the next year or two. Um, and so with that, I'm gonna go ahead and transition us to question and answer. We've got about 20 minutes. Um, and yeah, thanks for your time. Okay, oh yeah, so good. we've got everyone's faces. I'm gonna to try not to touch anything. Um, and I'm gonna try and, uh, you know, I might repeat the questions just in case David and Angela can't hear. Um, does anyone have any questions to get us started? Yep. Um, decades ago, which tells you how old I am, when we were dealing with the spot all, one of the things they said, the reason they needed to walk more on this side was that they were saving mill jobs. And I noticed, and then there was big controversy about the fact that the logs are being shipped overseas. But uh, so I'm wondering, you mentioned that the logs are being shipped to Idaho. So it, is there even no milling of the logs in the Eastern Oregon area? The uh, question is, are there mills in Eastern Oregon? I don't have the answer to that. But. Yeah, there are. Um, and I mean, I think the, the thing that I find interesting about it is, you know, we always hear from the industry, jobs, jobs, jobs. Right, exactly. But the reality is, you know, more board feet in a mechanized, modern, uh, mature industry doesn't mean more jobs. And it certainly doesn't mean more local jobs. Um, where there are local jobs are in things like prescribed fire, culvert replacement, road obliteration, um, hand fitting. Um, you know, hardening fire hardening homes if fire is your concern. Um, there's a lot of things that people could be doing that would be paying living wage jobs in local communities. Um, but the reality is that there is a timber industry still. It is much reduced in terms of um, jobs, um, but not necessarily in its ability to process timber. Um, the mill, the closest mills are in Lewiston, Idaho, um, Pilot Butte or Pilot Rock, which has actually a large diameter mill. Um, uh, yeah, near Pendleton. So there's a number of mills that, all the way down to John Day. There are mills. So um, if the logs go, they've got a place to get cut. The reality, though, is most of those dollars in that are, are not staying in these communities. And so, well, there's there's kind of just this myth that like if we just cut a few more logs, we'll you know we'll make Willow County great again. And that's just not the reality. Rinda, yeah, a couple of comments, and then a question. Uh, thank you, Brian, for uh, volunteer to do a broad walk. In that area, come on out, which is a great old dog's event to do three or four days where we do education, stewardship, and advocacy. So, thank you, Nikki. And, um, <laughs> well, I just wanted to ask you if you have the liberty to talk about litigation, uh, a particular litigation, and, and did you guys hear that on the Zoom? I was asked to talk about the uh, basically the screens litigation. Um, I mean, most of it's all pretty much out there. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, the the so the screens are this protection for trees over 21 inches in diameter in eastern Oregon. Um, they were created in the 1990s, basically when the timber wars were happening. Um, you know, the west side we had spotted owls, and we had the Northwest Forest Plan, and that meant that all of a sudden, more and more logging in eastern Oregon, eastern Washington, uh, and rightly people realized that was a problem too and so we got the screens which were meant to be a temporary placeholder rule folks who didn't like it love to point to that word temporary but what they ignore is that that's a half truth um, the full truth of it is it was a temporary rule until the forest service created holistic comprehensive protections um, and the recommendations for that included everything from uh, grazing road building logging all sorts of different things a major provision of that was a prohibition on cutting trees over 21 inches in diameter at breast height. 
Um, and their exceptions were regularly made. Large trees were cut even under those provisions. Um, but as you can imagine, the timber industry did not care very much for that at all. Uh, and so um, at the very end of the, the Trump administration, it's and, and Greg Walden's term, uh, we understand that Greg Walden um, actually made a personal visit to Donald Trump. I, I don't have evidence of this, but we've heard the stories enough that we believe them to be true. And so this is a priority to get rid of this rule. I want this to be my legacy. And so all of a sudden, at the height of the pandemic, like early days, um, all of the social uh, unrest that was happening, uh, they started a very undemocratic, very rushed, clearly with a purposeful, uh, a preordained uh, outcome, which was to get rid of the screens. And ultimately, indeed, that's what happened. Um, a standard became a guideline, which is to say a recommendation that the Forest Service ought to do their best whenever they possibly can to try to maybe protect some big trees. Um, and uh, they broke the law in doing so. And um, any idea that this wasn't politically driven was really um, upended when five days before the inauguration, um, even though the process was not over, a uh, political appointee of the Trump administration signed the decision ending any more public process and making it a rule. Unfortunately, um, we so we had to go to court, litigated. Um, Senator Wyden, Senator Merkley were not interested in, in helping on this. Um, the Biden administration, unfortunately, is defending the Trump rule. Um, we're joined in, I think there's seven conservation groups uh, and the Nez Perce tribe who are uh, suing the Forest Service. Very frustratingly, it uh, was supported by um, one or two conservation groups that um, you know, gave, the, gave cover to um, you know, Senator Merkley and Wyden to say, oh, it's complicated. We don't know what to do. Let's see and let's let the courts. Um, so our hearing, I think, is May 1st is the, are the oral arguments uh, in that case. We hope will prevail for its own merits, but also the really, really awful precedent that even the timber industry shouldn't want, that five days before an inauguration, you can just get rid of 30 years of protections. Um, and now we see with all these projects I mentioned, they're all including this component because this backcountry logging isn't really profitable unless you can cut the big trees. Now you can. And suddenly that's why we're seeing these 90,000 acre projects across the landscape. Um, I don't know if you guys have anything to add. That was a great overview, Rob. Thank you. Any other questions? Yep. Yeah. How much, what percentage of forest land in the Blue Mountains is owned by industry? And who are the companies? And are there any chemos or retos as a part of that? Um, so the question for you guys was, um, what percentage of the forests of the Blue Mountains are owned by industrial timber operators? Is that the yeah. question? Um, David, do you know that number? Putting you on the Not spot. off the top of my head, um, but I could try to look it up here. And then what was the second part to that question? Uh, wh who the main entities are and whether there's any TMOs or... Mm -hmm. Real estate investment. Real estate investment. And yeah. Yeah. And well, um, just to, to talk about that for a moment, it, the, you know, first of all, most of it is national forest land. Um, and there's also an interesting breakdown between industrial forest and private forest that I think is a, a little bit confused there. Um, uh, some For some uh, reason some of the lands in eastern Oregon that are managed industrially have been uh, characterized in a private forest ownership. Um, maybe that is because they're not owned by uh, a place like Weyerhaeuser that specializes in industrial forestry and they're owned more by these TMOs. I'm not entirely sure on that distinction, um, but we, we what we've been seeing here is the rapid uh, changing of ownership in these forest lands. So in just uh, 10 years or so, it's gone from uh, Boise Cascade to uh, forest capital. Forest capital was said, you know, we'll be holding on to these lands for a long time. And then it was kind of a joke, like the next issue of the chieftain, they said they were selling their lands it went off to Hancock. Um, and, um, and with each of these ownerships, the logging has just, it seems like become more and more aggressive. Uh, these are shareholder driven organizations that are not invested in local communities. Um, recently the, the land was um, then sold here. Some of the land here in Wallowa County was sold to Manulife. Uh, and I'm still not totally clear on um, who Manulife is and what their ethic is. Um, 
Um, definitely, I was very concerned with, with Hancock and looked into some of their global practices. There were, were issues with what they were doing all around the world. So there's just this rapid turnover of forest land that's really concerning. We're concerned about um, subdivision, that these, these companies are gonna sell off lands for real estate, make ranchettes and subdivisions. Uh, recently, we did have a good success in the lower Minam country where a large chunk of the Hancock forest lands was purchased in a collaboration between the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation and the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife to create the lower Minam wildlife refuge. And this was really great to see, like we wrote about this in our strategic forest reserves paper, the need to protect some of these private lands. One of the things that was notable in our paper was that, um, you know, we, we looked at this joint prioritization for all the lands for carbon, biodiversity, and the effects on drinking water. But we also looked at each of those rankings individually. And these private lands, when you looked at them um, for biodiversity, there's quite a bit of important uh, biodiversity um, uh, uh, values on privately owned lands. And so this, this lower Minam wildlife refuge is that kind of a place. It has a whole diversity of species and ecotones, but in the lower Minam, grasslands, wildflowers, mosaic forest, um, elk, wolves. And so we're really excited about that model we're also looking at some other things here in Wallowa County, uh, opportunities to create community forests. Uh, people are interested in doing that at larger scales. We've recently protected the, um, the East Moraine Community Forest, which is on the Moraines by Wallowa Lake. That's about 1800 acres and the largest single property on, in the lake basin. So that was a big success. Um, <clears throat> so we're moving forward with a, uh, multiple strategies to try to get lands uh, protected, conserved into a, a more of a conservation um, uh, paradigm, especially with these private industrial lands that are um, switching ownership quickly. We just, I just drove over to Lewiston with a colleague for a meeting a couple days ago and uh, a new area was heavily logged right off the road. Every time you drive through the North County now, you can see areas that are, are just hit hard by the private, um, uh, on the private lands out there. And these are areas that are right next to Joseph Canyon. When you overfly that country, the national forests are, it's like that classic view of Yellowstone where everything is cut on the edge. You can see the, the national forest and the interface with the private lands just based on forest management from the air. Um, so yeah, I um, hope that gets at some of, um, your question, I'd have to look up the actual numbers on ownership though. Well, and credit where credit's due, the private lands logging photo, that's Hancock. Um, and that's what they're, that's them. So, um, and then Angela might be able to speak to it better. One thing that is really neat too, is that we are seeing the Nez Perce, the Mipu, um, getting property back, whether it's people giving land back, like the Methodist church, um, to, I guess, atone for their sins. Um, or individual property owners um, giving it back or, or the tribe buying it. So there's a much greater tribal involvement. And that's a really exciting thing, especially given that, um, unfortunately, folks like Senator Merkley do not consider the Nez Perce tribe to be an Oregon tribe because they are incorporated in Idaho. Uh, and so the more that they're actually having land, I think the more of a voice they'll have. And I think that's a really positive thing, but I, don't, I can't speak too much to that. In the back? I wanted to just follow up on education. Um, I'm a lawyer that represents Blue Mountain Biodiversity Project, and there actually are multiple lawsuits. Yes. Yeah. Um, uh, Blue Mountain has filed a lawsuit down in Medford challenging the South Warner Project, which is the first one to actually do the research. Um, we're now facing a motion to dismiss in front of the Department of Justice that's going to be fully briefed by the next week. Um, so that's where our options are taking go. So we've got a strategy. We're all coordinating with us. It's a strategy to look at it from different directions. So there's that lawsuit. Um, Blue Mountains has also been challenging before they changed the screens. Uh, they were doing site specific events, doing end runs around the screens, and Blue Mountains has been challenging those since 2012. Uh, in 2012, which involved lawsuits uh, with Elk Canyon. Uh, the Snow Basin lawsuit, the challenge to the site specific amendments one, and uh, the district court judge in Portland ruled that those were illegal under many circumstances, and most of the national forests, at least one of them, stopped using them 
at the one point in uh, except for the mountain, uh, which is the Kansas Mountain. Know, and we now have a loss again in the Mount here. We can't do it across the time stop down and put the high specific thing in the Mount here. That's also pending in the Mount and fully briefed this is for a decision to not trade there. Um, I'm also not going to be shy. I'm going to name names about, you mentioned uh, the environmental group that unfortunately had taken the position on the other side. I'm only going to name one name. Um, that I think they deserve being called out for this, which is the Western Environmental Law Center, which mm -hmm. shocks a lot of people. Yeah. Um, they are actively supporting the collaborative in the Mount here. They actively are supporting the change to the streets. Uh, I think they should be ashamed of this. They generally do excellent work. I'm personal friends with many of the lawyers there. I don't understand why they would take that position, uh, but they do excellent work. Thanks. And if I can have just one brief thing to that, um, and, and we just got an update on the, the Blue Mountain Biodiversity lawsuit, because um, there are yeah many, many plaintiffs in, in case, two cases in this case now. Um, one thing that's really interesting about that Snow Basin case, the Forest Service went back, redesigned the project without cutting the large trees, and they, by their own analysis, agreed it was better on all, on all fronts. Wow. Karen? Yeah, I'm, I'm the director of Blue Mountain Biodiversity Project as well. Blue Mountain Biodiversity Project for Wayne Road. I just want to uh, give great thanks to all the panel participants and people who arranged for this panel. The Eastern Oregon lands and indigenous people's lands usually get short shifted and not so much attention. I want to point out that. Um, the Morgan Nested Sale on Nespers and Nimiku land. Uh, we have been field surveying it for the last two field seasons, like one week, one field season, two weeks the next, and we're going back again to gather evidence as to existing conditions in that sale uh, with uh, volunteers. And we welcome anyone who wants to come out and help us with a field survey of the sale and in the process, see what's at stake out there. I've never been in a timber sale in 31 years of field monitoring outside of an inventory roadless area that had this much never logged forest that is planned for logging. It's really magnificent. There's a lot of old growth, a lot of large trees, and a lot of wildlife signs. Very beautiful. It goes from dry to very, very moist. And uh, there's very steep um, cliffs, so to speak, where we were climbing pretty much vertically. To get into the sale units right over creeks with mid columbia steelhead trout. The sediment would inevitably fall into the creeks and streams. We're afraid they're going to violate the riparian buffer and affect the water quality for the fish. Um, and we're very nervous they're going to large log large trees and old growth, and we need all the help we can get to stop this. Um, and we're completely working with other groups. And uh, I'd like you all to support these groups in one way or another. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And, and to that, um, there's a lot of credit to go around. You know, we couldn't have as many panelists as we'd like, but actually the the what we call the Trump screens really helped actually motivate us and realize that we were being spoken for by groups uh, that claim we speak for the conservationists in Eastern Oregon. And no, they didn't. Uh, and so I hope I don't forget anybody, but um, in particular, uh, Central Oregon Land Watch, Wild Earth Guardians, um, Great Old Broads, Sierra Club, uh, Oregon Wild, GHCC, and in uh, a non-official capacity, uh, the Nez Perce Tribe have, have all been really good partners uh, working together. Um, Craig Law Center, Earth Rise, um, doing a lot of really great work. I was about to mention Craig. Mm -hmm. Craig. <laughs> yeah. Great work. Any other questions? Yep. Um, this may not be quite popular, but I want to give a shout out to the Forest Service. I bought um, an inholding in the Fremont Forest 52 years ago, and I went to law school here so I could fight a bunch of the timber sales to stop what they were doing 50 years ago. But over the last 20 years, they've done a bunch of thinning and fire prep, um, um, cut a lot of trees, but the 21 inch rule was in place. 20 months ago, the bootleg fire started eight miles from our place. We were the first place to burn down, totally incinerated, all gone. But that fire went on, it's the third largest fire in Oregon's history. And it 
it burned hundreds of houses and I forgot 600,000 acres or something. I stand where our house used to be and there's some nice green forest with big, large ponderos and it's where the forest service had gone in and cut a whole bunch of trees and then underburned it. And that's the only healthy forest we have left. And it, I've worked with these guys in the in the Fremont and especially the Bly district where I live. And it's, they're trying to do it right. So I, I think to speak to that, you know, the forest service isn't made up of evil doers. I mean, there's maybe a few, but um, generally speaking, it's good people that, that have these jobs because they care deeply. You know, they, they became wildlife biologists because they cared about wildlife and they became silviculturists because I think trees are cool. Um, you know, but the reality is they have timber targets and they don't have targets for carbon sequestration and they don't have targets for salmon coming back and they don't have targets for whether or not grizzly are back and they don't have targets for how many goshawk are left. And that's how you get promoted. And so that's how the, that's what's really running the show there. And um, I think you're right that there, there's an appropriate place for thinning, um, but there's a lot of places that aren't. And so I think what you're talking about, there may be examples, and I'm not familiar with it, so I can't speak to it, where it may make sense to, to cut some trees, maybe even aggressively. And we're talking about the ignition zone of homes. We're competing with the Elemental movie right now, which you guys should all make a point to watch. Um, you know, cutting trees, mild, old growth trees and forests that have never been logged miles from the nearest road in the wildest landscape left in the lower 48 that's not protected by wilderness. There's, there's no reason to go out and aggressively almost clear cut those forests. And that's what we're talking about here as, as the problem. Um, and, you know, so I think we, we have this increased pace and scale of logging and it's all measured by board feet sent to the mill and acres treated, which means logged. If we were talking about uh, thinning near homes and communities, it'd be a very different discussion. And that's just not not what we're talking about here. So I want to be clear. I think you're, there are examples of where, from my perspective, and I don't speak for anybody else, but that are you know you can't. There's there's a place where where some of that work can make sense in the woods. But another thing is um, these forests are not those dry pine forests. They didn't burn every five to fifteen years. An awful lot of them are not suffering from a lack of fire. They their their life history is that they grow big and dense and messy and from a and you know if you're a fuel specialist just a nightmare, but if you're a if you're a if you're a flying squirrel or a goshawk it's your dream come true, and over the millennia those places burned in stand replacing what we would call catastrophic fires and then they grew back up and that's what they're supposed to do, so I think it's it's just it is complicated but I, I will absolutely accept your point like you know I hope we're not vilifying the individual human beings that work at the Forest Service. But we do need a fundamental paradigm shift in how these these forests are managed, from my perspective. I think we have time for one more question, especially questions for uh, yeah. David or Angela. Also, I just want to make sure that. Okay. Yeah. I just wanted to say thank you. Um, I'm with the Southern Utah Wilderness Alliance, and I'm going on the left, so we deal with a lot of the similar things in the finding different forests, which is like, if you want to talk about how unpopular Eastern Oregon forests are, put them down in the Colorado Plateau, and like with the little ugly trees that no one cares about that are amazing and full growth. I just want to say thank you because I think how you described the way that these treatments or these projects are proposed, we've seen it huge shift in sort of the messaging. You know, it used to be, at least in our neck of the woods, it was grazing. We were doing this to grazing to create more forage. Or we're doing it for X, Y, and Z reasons. It was always fire. Now, whether or not, like you said, the same thing, the forest, let's say, the fire is going to go over 200 plus years, stand replacing what they're supposed to do. But almost everyone in these projects has switched up to you know, some sort of fire prevention. Again, not anywhere near the level of the interface. And just the greenwashing that's happening, I think, nationwide on forests, on BLM lands, on anything like that, you have to dig under several levels of sort of nonsense window dressing to actually figure out what they're doing and why. And I think there's so much stuff flying under the radar for that reason. Because when you shoot, when you hear watershed restoration, you don't think about chaining or masticating or hand treatments or whatever. And so that's like everywhere that you can find right now. And I think it's really how you put a point on it with the Eastern Oregon forest. Like, oh yeah, this would be great. And I think there's more agency folks who may have raised the alarm a while ago who are sort of getting back on board with these things for that very reason too. Because the public just isn't paying attention. So I guess wherever everyone is from, this is a huge issue. And they're not just going to call it on anymore. It's, it's not going to be X, Y, and Z, but it's exactly what you said. Like, there's actually an uptick, I think, nationwide on public lands and stuff right now. 
Angela and David, we just heard from some folks at SUA, and I will say, uh, of, other than the groups that are part of our Eastside Forest Coalition, you're one of my favorite groups in, in America, and a group I actually really want to talk to, because you guys are dealing with really similar issues in really hostile places, and what I'm impressed with you guys do is you've had great success in places where conservation is theoretically not popular, so we want to learn from you guys. But I think a big piece of this, and again, is like we want to be able to tell our own stories because, yeah. you know, the Timber Wars on OPB tells this wonderful story yeah. where everything's better now because we're all sitting down and they're ignoring the fact that they also marginalized anybody who dis whose voice dissented. And um, and so, you know, say again, with this, they are logging old growth. And when we FOIA'd them, the response was, we trust you implicitly. And so when this stuff sounds really good, um, we need folks like you in the room. And this is why we're here is to educate you to call bullshit on it. Um, to know, it, it, okay, it's restoration, but show me what it actually is rather than just taking them at their word for it. And in some cases, it may be, and we should celebrate those projects and we should all get behind them. Um, but these other projects that are not, um, they should be held accountable for it. Um, so, you mentioned right. Lyme disease. It's another huge mm -hmm. driver. Um, I think Andrew's talking about like, congressional appropriations. There's something in there for watershed restoration or fuels treatment reduction products, and that's driving most of these projects, which is probably a good work. Yeah. And I see that Angela uh, has her hand raised, so I'm going to let her speak on the, uh, on the sorry, one second. Southern U. Yeah. Sorry, I didn't mean to take over. Oh, no worries. Was that an accidental hand raise, Angela? <laughs> no, no, it wasn't. Okay. I just, you acknowledged me, so I took it down. Yeah. I, no, I just want to make sure that people understand that Part of this problem is created by Congress because Congress has been starving the Forest Service for decades now for funding. They are now operating with fewer staff and fewer specialists than they did in the early 90s when I started my career with them. That is not sustainable and it does not lead to good decision making and stewardship of the lands they're charged with managing. And, you know, we would like to see more of a stewardship approach. And yet when we ask them to do fuels reduction of the medium and fine fuels under the forest canopy, in some cases, they're like, oh, that's not profitable. That would cost us money, the money that we don't have. They often authorize tens of thousands of acres of prescribed burning, which is a huge, amazing tool that needs to, to happen on some of these landscapes. And yet again, there's no money to implement. And so, their only tool in the toolbox is commercial logging because it can pay for itself. And that, so the, the agency has been hamstrung in many cases because of the lack of funding and the lack, frankly, of ecological understanding of the people holding the purse strings. And so that's why we see commercial logging is the only tool they have to offer us. And in areas where that's not profitable, they don't do anything. Yep. Thanks. Yeah. Well, um, on that note, why don't we give our presenters, especially the two people who can't hear us, <laughs> awesome. Well, I'm going to uh, release you guys, and the rest of us will be around to chat afterwards if you'd like to talk more. Thank you so much. Thanks, David. Thanks, Angela. Thank you, Will. Thank you, Will. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah Will. MVP. Sorry about that. Hey, you didn't have to.